Hi, everyone. How are you? Is it still morning? Yes. Good morning. I'm on East Coast time, so it feels very, very like the afternoon for me. But just want to thank you all for welcoming us here today. We're really excited to be a part of this culture shifting weekend and to really contribute to this mission about like increasing equity and narrowing the gap, especially in tech spaces where there's incredible amounts of opportunity um, and we have such incredible creative entrepreneurial minds and we really want to just encourage what it could look like for especially as we start to move into this metaverse space. I know this is a word everyone has been hearing today. We're going to unpack that a little bit um, but we're just really thrilled to be here and talk on this um, topic today. Before we dive into that, I want to introduce Alton Glass here. I'm thrilled to be on the stage with you today, Alton. We've had a chance to work together in different ways over the last few years. Um, and Alton has an incredible story, which we will dive in today. But please join me in welcoming Alton to the stage. Thank you. So um, just a little bit on Alton. He is one of the premier creators in the immersive space, at least by my standards. Um, he's head of GRX Immersive, a storyteller, a mentor, someone who is behind really, really incredible immersive content pieces that are all about telling our stories and shifting culture, like Times, um, what is it, The March, right, which chronicles um, the March on Washington and the I Have a Dream speech. It's an immersive experience, incredibly interesting. We have to make sure everyone has a chance to experience that. Um, and also like, in protest as well, which is a piece that looks at the Black Lives Matter movement and all of the protests over 2020 after um, the unfortunate murder of George Floyd. So, you know, the, the immersive platform is such an incredible tool and Alton has mastered the art of using it from a storytelling and culture shifting perspective. So really glad that you're here. I appreciate that. Okay, so can we talk about the metaverse just for a second before we get into the conversation? Um, Alton, I know you hear this term metaverse a lot, uh, but for the audience quickly, has anyone used virtual reality before? Hands, I see a couple. What about augmented reality? Does, for those who are, aren't raising their hands, do you know what those things are? Okay. You know, filters on your phone, augmented reality, in its nascent stages, but that's essentially what it is. Okay, cool. So those technologies are really kind of the underpinnings of what the metaverse will be. The metaverse we keep talking about barely exists today. There are there are examples of it that we'll see. I mean, who has kids who play with like Roblox, Fortnite? Like these are early examples of what a metaverse could look like. But really when we're using that term, we're talking about the next generation of the internet, right? So, you know, 10 years ago, we were moving from like desktop web to mobile, right? For the next decade, we're gonna be moving from mobile to the metaverse. All of that information that's currently, I don't have my phone with me, but currently at our fingertips, in our smartphones, we can communicate with anyone, we can get information about anything. Imagine that moving up around us. So instead of like FaceTiming and having to hold your phone awkwardly and try to be at a good angle so you don't look crazy, um, <laughs> imagine if there's a hologram of the person that you're FaceTiming with, or you're walking down the street and you see a new restaurant, hmm, that looks cool. You pull out your phone, you have to Google it, you look up and, you know, how can you find a reservation? Imagine if you have on some type of AR, AR wearable, you look at the restaurant and all that information pops up for you. So this is kind of what we're referring to when we talk about the metaverse. Um, but what I would love to talk with you today about um, Alton is how we can make sure that the metaverse is a space and a place for us, um, for us, <laughs> and, and provides opportunity for us, something that we can all take advantage of. But um, before we get into that, can you just tell us your story? Mm, you know, like, how did you get here? So my background is, uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, um, my background is film and television, so I started off as a director. Um, I had a production company doing movies for television, family movies, holiday movies, things like that. 
And um, I was at a space where um, I, I didn't want to continue asking for permission to be great and do the things I wanted to do. And I remember around the time um, I was up for another movie, my manager said, hey, you should check into this thing that you shared with me called Virtual Reality. Probably about six or seven years ago. Didn't know much about it, went to an expo, and um, I, didn't, I didn't see any representation of people of color or anything. And I was wondering, so I started researching the investments being made into this space, and I'm like, wow, what happens you know, five or six years from now if this becomes something? And we have to knock on the door again and say, is there a diversity and inclusion initiative for virtual reality? So I said, you know, let me change my company over to learning more about this field and how I can leverage it for empowering my storytelling. And along the way, um, it was challenging, but we made a significant investment to really see where we could take it. And um, we made a piece uh, called A Little Love. Uh, we got into the Oculus Launchpad, and then we showcased it at American Black Film Festival. Thank Jeff Friday for giving us the opportunity to bring something people had never seen before in that space. And uh, Verizon saw it, and they were like, hey, this is so powerful. Can you do this for education? And we had never thought about that, because I'm, I'm a filmmaker. I don't want to go <laughs> in schools, teaching, and stuff like that. But what we understood was that storytelling is education. And we were, mm -hmm. we were taking and bringing people to an immersive space and sort of bringing these, as a friend of mine was to call them, prosthetic memories. Like, virtual reality showed me that I had the power to create new realities. And that's what really, really helped us understand how to leverage sto immersive storytelling and that we were building metaverses in a sense. And uh, through going through the program at Oculus Launchpad, started to meet other developers who were technologists and it started to empower me to say, I can do this. And then we started GRX Immersive Labs and now we uh, create immersive story experiences and we build educational curriculum to help bring people into how they can take control of this space and leverage their unique point of view. That's, that's amazing. And actually, there's something that you mentioned that I think is really important to kind of put out here, especially as folks are thinking about, you know, where there's space for you to start to take advantage of immersive technologies and metaverse type platforms. But you mentioned the power of VR in education, and VR and AR as well, actually. And you know, because essentially you're bringing experiences to life. Yeah. You know, we've all experienced sitting in like a history class and I don't know, like the eighth grade or something, learning about, you know, the revolution or the civil war. Imagine being able to like experience that around you. Imagine the, the impact that that would have, the way that, that that information might stick differently as opposed to just reading black and white words on paper. Yeah. Um, you know, that's just like an incredible use case for the technology that goes far beyond gaming. How have you, you know, kind of leveraged some of your work in the education space? I mean, you yourself have kind of trailblazed um, in, this, in this sector. Uh, have you used that as a form of like mentorship for others? Oh, 100%. So what I love about the immersive technology space and in the metaverse is that you're meeting people where they are, but you're also bridging gaps between the younger people who really understand the technology very quickly, and then older people who, like my mom sometimes, she's tough to get into Zoom or she on FaceTime and the phone is like right here in the face. So we're like bridging the gap to teach each other, right? Because the, the older generation has the keys and the knowledge, right, and the history, and the younger people understand the technology, and when you bring that together, you create a really powerful, special, bond and you can close that gap, right? And push both of them forward. And that builds a really good, strong community. So we've seen that when we put on our immersive exhibits like the March on Washington where these young people never knew much about how they got 200,000 people to a march when they didn't have social media, right? And <laughs> they're like, okay, I can do this and I can empower other people with these technologies. So it's an amazing opportunity to build community around this technology and then show them the creative entrepreneurship spaces where they can take this to the next level. So let's talk about that, like taking it to the next level. Um, you know, like I said, you trailblazed this space, right? You saw an opportunity and you, you found opportunities to support your desire to get into the immersive space. You mentioned Oculus Launchpad, but you know, what, what was that journey like going from you know, traditional platforms of where content is being used? You said you know, you're a creator, you're a filmmaker. Um, how was that transition into this new medium? What were some of the barriers that you might have 
like you might have faced and how did you navigate those spaces? Ooh, -wee. that was a tough one. Uh, it was really challenging. And um, it, it really, really started to, to beat up my confidence actually because I come from making films where I, like, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew how to right, do that. That's your superpower. That was my superpower. And then when you moved, I moved into the tech space. I'm like, man, now I'm actually in, a, in an environment where I don't know anything about even the terminology. So it was really, really challenging, and that was a big barrier for me. But I had to just lean into my, my perspective and point of view and, and learn from other people. And along the way, I was able to get a lot of support from developers. So now you have this really unique space of entertainment and technology, that convergence, where we're learning from each other and we're helping each other push this forward. Because VR was at the, at the you know, it's a very nasty medium. So in the beginning, we, everyone wanted to see, the community wanted to see this thing push forward. So it's in our best interest to try to work together. But it was challenging financially because it was very, very costly to actually, you know, shoot something because everything was so manual back then. You had to stitch it together and put it all together. But um, being able to get into certain communities and, and, and leverage those resources and get developers to, we're developers in our own right. And that's what I learned, right? And, and that's how I got over a lot of the hurdles, just pushing and leaning into my discomfort, really, and, 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 and getting over those hurdles. And eventually we got over them I and we made what we needed to make. Um, but it was, it was tough keeping the lights on in the first couple of years because you didn't know what to do <laughs> with the tools, you know? I, I can only imagine. Um, you know, I keep thinking from the perspective of we want to see more people like yourself in this space, you know, kind of getting back to this point about, you know, what the metaverse can be and what it can look like. This is a space that they can be like built by us, 100%. for us. Like if the metaverse, which is, it, the internet today, right, which is I think the closest parallel that we can draw to the metaverse is a collection of websites, right? A collection of spaces, you know, some are open to everyone, some are more private, like password protected, or you have to have a membership. That is essentially what the metaverse could look like, right? A collection of spaces and places. So it's important for us to take advantage of the opportunity to get in at this ground level, you know, making sure that our perspectives are represented, that the, the issues that impact our communities that could be different from other communities, that they are taken into account in these spaces. I mean, there's, there are like pockets of development happening. Um, I actually, I follow a handle, it's called Black and Meta, and there's a, I'm from DC. I don't know, is anyone from DC in the audience? Okay, there is a go-go club in the metaverse. This means nothing to those of you who are not from DC, I understand. But, you know, like imagine as like a nascent technology, you're a person of color, maybe you are not a gamer, and you like, okay, someone, I heard about this VR thing, this AR thing, I'm gonna check out this metaverse, and you find something that, that like resonates with you that way. 100%. You know, um, that's, what, that's what we ultimately want, like long term. This is not just something that Meta is building alone, or just even like big tech companies in general are building alone. So, you know, kind of getting back to, to this, like how do we, how do we actually make that come to fruition? So for, like for me at Meta, where one of my big goals is making sure that the metaverse is an inclusive place, that there's access for different communities, no matter what your socioeconomic situation looks like, um, and that you know, developers of color, creators of color are having an opportunity to get in at the ground level. How do we actually encourage that with intention? Like, what are some of the supports beyond just even, you know, like a grant to like a developer that could really encourage entry into the space? I would say bringing, bringing your identity into the space is the most important thing because that's what creates those communities, right? Uh, understanding your DNA, like, and, and your unique perspective. And as you, and you'll connect and find that there are other people that are just like you or want to grow those communities. And that's when you start to see that there's riches in those niches, right? To, to grow those opportunities. And that's how it started for us. We, we were very, very focused on one particular area and we started to see, you know, and understand that what we were doing was empowering people. And then through that mentorship and, and the content, they were going out and doing the same thing and then growing these communities. And now we're starting to see all these other virtual 
labs and virtual experiences pop up outside of us and it's like it's amazing to see that growing so you have people taking their point of view and growing and then with a few resources you can continue to uh, grow that slowly but surely but our goal is to build the train tracks because the rail you know the the the, the train is coming and, and we're on the ground right now and we have an opportunity to really shape what that space looks like um, from the ground up you know yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned um, community. And, you know, again, this is since it's like a nascent space. How has it been different for you um, now that you have really focused on immersive content? What are the distribution channels look like? I mean, in the film industry, they're very, you know, clear. It's, a, it's an industry that's been around forever. So the distribution channels are very obvious. But in immersive content, there's so many different mediums, there's so many different platforms. Like, how does, um, <laughs> you okay back there? All right, just check in. Um, but like, how does your, how does community play into that? I think that's the beautiful part about it because when I started in film, you make a film, they will market it, tell you where to show up, right? But you didn't really, other than doing a Q&A, you didn't really get deep into the community, right? Um, and with, with immersive, and this concept of the metaverse, you're actually connecting with each and every individual, right? And you're, um, you're building a community. So I, I did a program with uh, Black Public Media and CERNA and MacArthur Foundation, and, and they taught us about community engagement. And that's when the light clicked when we were making immersive content. It was like, okay, you're building the distribution model through community. So like now what we've seen is, uh, when we like when we did Tribeca Film Festival, we also made sure we were intentional about going into the communities like Brooklyn and hosting an experiential activation within that community with the Brick Foundation. And then people would show up to these and say, "Oh, I love this. Can we also showcase this with our organization or our community?" And they would have their own budgets and licensing fees, and they would license it. We would train them, and they would distribute it. So you're starting to see as you build this network, it's becoming a true network. And then when you start to build these virtual spaces, they mimic the physical spaces, and you start to really build an entire, you know, community out of that and grow that network. So that's what we're starting to see now. So that's, that's really fascinating. So essentially, because it's so early mm -hmm. in, in the process of all of this development around the metaverse, the people at the ground floor are building the networks. They mm -hmm. we are building the distribution channels, which is a huge opportunity. And it, it reminds me of something that you and I have talked about in the past, and it's how you're creating something that's investable, not just employable. Right. And I think that is, when we talk about making the metaverse a place that is like absolutely meaningfully and substantively equitable, and inclusive, this piece about being investable, I think is really important, tying the, the economic opportunity aspect to the, the metaverse, right? Um, I just think that that's, really, that's a really strong point that you've made in the past and how you have this opportunity to kind of create something entirely new that really makes, that other people will want to leverage. And it's, it's spaces that you might not think about, right? So like. One of our core values is even if you don't start a business, learn and think like one, right? So you, we, we've had individuals who have come in, trained, understood how to leverage their immersive experiences, and then they've gone into libraries and built networks through libraries because people say, oh, you can't get on the internet. Uh, you know, if you don't have internet, you can't do VR. No, you go, the library is like a major community hub that's untapped. Mm -hmm. So now we're starting to see yep. certain libraries convert over to innovation labs, and they're adopting immersive labs and they're, they're building creative entrepreneurs who are taking this to the next level and going to connect with businesses and say, hey, let me create an immersive experience for your business. Now they're taking this and they're growing it in those non-traditional spaces. And they're becoming not just employed, but they're becoming investable within their community and taking those new skill sets and starting businesses out of them. Wow. So we've talked about you know, education use cases. There's you know, use cases for AR and VR you know, in the communities for small businesses. What other ways have you seen people kind of take advantage of the, the technology in general? Ooh, um, during COVID, one of the biggest communities of the organization I thought was pretty hit pretty hard was museums. Um, they didn't have the, yep. the technology, uh, they had the technology resources, but they didn't have the technology skills in the community to really help close that gap. And they didn't really know much about immersive. 
So now you're starting to see more funding being put towards these Smithsonian's and these other museums. And you're able to see people training in the immersive space, building metaverses sort of communities for these museums. So now they're able to come in, host an immersive experience in a library, I mean, in a museum. And then what was beautiful about the one we did with Time Magazine was um, we saw people in the community training in VR and then getting, uh, uh, starting organizations to train other people to host these immersive experiences at these museums. So now they're growing yeah. their experiences. And then I just recently saw a, um, a museum who was now we're gonna put like $20 million towards our immersive initiative. It's like they're starting to see mm -hmm. the opportunity to create experiences and job opportunities and grow that community. So that's a, another space I'm starting to grow. And, me, and medical um, is growing yeah. very fast. Uh, architecture for real time. I'm starting to see a lot of architecture. We, when the program we did with FAMU, it was amazing to see we came in and showed them how to get into immersive. And the students in architecture department started to take their pre-existing skills in architecture design and put those into VR to walk their clients through a virtual experience. Wow. And I thought that was amazing. One of the students called me and said, Alton, I just got an opportunity creating VR renderings from my architectural degree. So that's a great space to move into. Yeah, you know? and for context, this was just, this was what, a couple of years ago, a program where we had an opportunity to work together to just try to get some HBCU students thinking about the immersive space. So we just got some 360 cameras, some VR headsets, and Alton kind of trained, created a kind of a boot camp to teach these kids how to make like a campus tour, right? You know, something simple and something that they could take pride in and add their own flavor to. And so to see you know, something just like that, just like planting the seed and how it has blossomed into the same students, like bringing these technologies and opportunities into like the architectural school and that program, that's incredible to see. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, and then now you're moving to the concept of Web3, you're starting to see more people uh, looking to create more experiences uh, for the metaverse to, you know, get into NFTs and leveraging those 3D assets into the metaverse. So you're seeing a lot of content creators understanding how to monetize and create ownership uh, of their IP in the space, which is, which is amazing. And we've also seen, um, actually uh, participated in a conversation last week with someone from an organization called Jobs for the Future. Mm. And they did a pilot with small businesses to just see how they might use augmented reality and virtual reality technology. And it was such a powerful tool for upskilling workers, for giving people a completely you know, new skill set or training people on, um, especially for jobs that can be inherently dangerous, right? Mm. You have this, this ultra realistic experience through the training. So by the time you're actually hands on, perhaps like in a manufacturing facility with like, you know, heavy or dangerous equipment, mm -hmm. the, the margin of error was just much far less and, you know, essentially creating a safer environment for folks. So we've just, we've seen so many of these really incredible use cases popping up and we really just want to continue to encourage them to see more. Well, again, thank you all for your time. Thank you for your engaging questions. Um, Alton, thank you for thank joining you. us today and sharing your story. Have a good one.